What up, y'all? This is your Don Israel coming to you live from Lit, asking y'all to subscribe to the channel. So make sure y'all subscribed, make sure y'all liking the videos, make sure y'all commenting, and make sure you turn on your notifications that let you know when new videos are dropping. We're dropping them daily, and you want to be on it, because we on it, all right? So keep it lit, keep it locked, subscribe, we out. Mark Duce is a dream. What's going on, y'all? It's your boy. You're Don Israel, a.k.a. Liddy Fontaine. Pretty Liddy's what they call me. And we back again with another episode of Lit, the premier platform for all things literary, swaggy, and everything in between. Today's guest is a special guest, the golden goose who lays a lot of golden <laughs> eggs. He didn't bring half of as many books as he published. Actually, these ain't even his books. These are my books. We got Jason Reynolds in the yeah. building. What's going on, guys? Thank what you that? for coming, bro. Yo, before we start, my bad. I know we already started recording. I just got <laughs> Keep it rolling. Hold up. <laughs> Hold on, Sam. Yo. So they can hear me on the audio. I, hold up, hold up. This is real meta, what we doing right now. Yeah, yeah, This is real meta. Reach in here real quick. Get my other books. I'm coming right back. First of all. Oh! Yeah, 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 hey. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell y'all. Let me, let me show y'all something right here. First of all, to all my fellow writers out there, my colleagues, uh, you don't come to nobody's house without bringing something for the for the people who hosting you. That's And, yeah. the, and the truth is, is that Deuce ain't cost money. Yes. And uh, so for all the homies, I had to get you a shorty because I was traveling, so I couldn't. I couldn't take the big job. <laughs> Thank you, brother. But to all, the, all to everybody coming on the show, I'm not saying you have to. I'm right. just saying we got to think about the people who support us, and we got to support them. That's, right? That's what we're doing. You know what I'm saying? Right? That's, that's the culture right? for the culture. That's that's, that's that's my G, man. Thank yeah, you. Man. Got the, the little the, the little mini, the little mini. Yeah, yeah. I'm about to drink all that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to drink all that. All right, so we got to We got to have you. Welcome through the the swag. Yeah, let's do it. Let me go. Right. Stand up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so we doing. What are we doing? We doing super casual today. Okay. So we doing. Are we gonna start the shoes? Yeah. So these the golden goose. These yeah. that the hot top golden goose. Yeah. With the uh with the the, the cheetah laces. Yeah. I came, with that, that, came, that. came with them. Came with them like that. Okay. These are the the rag and bone fit ones. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And this is a uh, old school linen uh Eero t shirt. Okay. You know what I mean? It's all ripped up. Came that way to all the kids out there. Don't buy clothes like this, uh, but I did. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this is all you know. You got you know a little did all the David Yerman, you know, David a little Yerman, Yerman little, another you know, guy, another guy. A, 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 exactly. That's the, that's that's my man, that Mitch Jackson. Loves Mitch Jackson, David exactly. Yerman. Shout out to Mitch Jackson. Yeah, 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 that's my man. So let's get into this, right? You got it. We drinking first. Coming from the yeah, you got the Marduse. You know how this rock. Yes. Yeah. So we do the you know drink to the leaves. Drink to the leaves. And then, you know, we pour up. That's smart. Drink yeah. to the leaves. I like that. Yeah. Drink uh, a little mini bottle. I might have to drink a little lower than the leaves. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, bring, you brought a bottle, so we can pour more yeah. for you. You bring the bottles. Oh, that's good, too. Let me, get, let me just want to take a little yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, mm. Now, we going to hit me. This is about to turn the drink champs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look. Anybody who knows me. Lit. Drink champs dish. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Now I close it up. Yeah. Now shake it up. Yeah. It's a little, little counterclockwise. You know all right. Let me see what we. Let me see what. Let me see what we hitting on. Cheers, bro. Salute, brother. Let me see what we got. Oh, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> delicious. So, people that don't know, I met Jason in two thousand fourteen fall. I had just gotten into the MFA program at the new school. Saw you, you was at dinner with a friend of ours, writer. Yeah. Pulled up on you at Peaches. It's like a hip hop story. Like I saw you, I was like, I came, I saw you walking, I saw you walking down to my house and I came, I went to drop my shit off and I ran back and I was like, yo, I know you don't know me, but I know you, you're a writer. I got this thing called literary swag. Yeah. It's going to be the future. And the dopest thing you did when you ain't tell me, yo, get the fuck out of my face, son. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you like, let me rock. Yeah, man. And like three years later, you on the show, bro. Yo. The first, this is so much history here. The first person to do a literary swag interview. When look, this look book dropped right here. This was when Book Court was, what was this book? Book Court. Yeah, Book Court, book court, was, was, yeah, book court was open. Like, we, this is history, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, book Court is not even, don't even exist no more, so. Nah, though. Hey, yo, it's crazy, right? Because I feel like, like, I remember that day so vividly, but I also just remember, like, we under, both of us had a conversation. You you literally was like, yo, I feel like we could figure out a way to, 
to sort of turn the corner. Like, there's currency and cool, right? And, yeah. and we try to front like it's not. And I know everybody, I was reading this thing the other day, it was like, all of us are nerds, all of us are nerds. And it's like, look, there's nothing wrong with being a nerd, right? And yeah. being a nerd does not mean being uncool. The two don't have to be separate, right? That you could yeah. that you could be a nerd and you could be fly, right? Like, yeah. and, and that those things could go hand in hand, just like most of our heroes were cool and they were nerds. You know yeah. what I mean? I, yo, prime example. Bro, like Saul Williams, the first time I met Saul Williams, and I had been following Saul for years because I was yeah. a poet at first, and I'm sure you're getting all that, but <laughs> the first time I met him in yeah. real life, I bumped into him in the Prada store mm. on Prince and Broadway. Yeah. And to see Saul Williams, a dude that everybody was like, oh, he's he's, you know, mad esoteric and abstract and like kind of crunchy back in the day, crunchy. and this, you know what I'm saying? All yeah. of that. But when I meet him face to face, he's standing in the Prada store in a suit. Like shopping, shopping, no, like getting busy in it, and and that moment was funny for me because it was like, yo, if Saul Williams could get fly, it, it, no, meant, it meant something yeah, to me. Yeah, you know what it, I mean? it, it's no excuse. Yeah. So, what was your portal into into literature? Rap music. <laughs> <laughs> Real shit, like, like like he was cute. Like, <laughs> yo, Real, like yo, yeah. but that's the truth, right? Like, look, man, I tell this story all the time. Like, the truth is, is that when I was growing up. 19 from, from the 80s like in the 80s and through most of the 90s you know, it wasn't, there were no books for kids growing up in my neighborhood there were no books for kids growing up in your neighborhood for that matter not about not about who you were right yeah. and so you figure there are, there are three major uh three major sort of benchmarks in in, in my childhood and that's uh crack cocaine yeah uh hiv yeah and rap music and you grew up I got DC. Yeah, DC. DC. So 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 there's right so you got those three those are your monsters. Yeah. And there ain't no books about that. Mm -hmm. Right? So if it's if it's 1988, if it's 1993, right? So 1992, right? And we're talking about murder capital of the world time, right? Mm -hmm. There are no books outlining what your life might be like for kids. Mm -hmm. So what was I going to read? We reading Toni Morrison, right? We reading uh, uh, Ernest Gaines. Shout out to Ernest Gaines, whose new book just came out. You should check it out. Uh, shout out to Ernest Gaines. We're reading Ernest Gaines. We're reading Harper Lee. We're reading books from the 70s, 60s, and 50s, but yeah. there were no books written in the 80s about the 80s, about teenage life, except for maybe Walter D. Myers' Scorpions, and he had a few others, right? But for the yeah. most part, when you think about it, and Sister Soldier came later, but when you think yeah. about it, there was nothing for you. So rap music was, um, you know, that shit was like, God, yo. It was like listening to, I got an older brother who's nine years older, so I got to listen to, you know, KRS and yeah. Public Enemy and NWA and Big Daddy Kane and Rakim and Salt and Pepper and MC Light and, and like, I got to listen to them, Queen Latifah, who was a hero of mine, right? Yeah. Uh, what they were saying made more sense, right? To hear Slick Rick say, you know, Dave the Dope Fiend shooting dope that don't know the meaning of water nor soap. Yeah. Was like, where I don't know who Scout is and To Kill a Mockingbird, but I know Dave the Dope thing. Yeah, I know Dave. You see what I'm saying? Like, that makes more sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so, rap music was it. I started reading liner notes, dude. I would go buy cassette tapes, take them home, listen to the music, pull out the liner notes and read liner notes. And, and that's when I started creating sort of connections between uh, what Queen Latifah was saying in Ladies First and what yeah. Maya Angelou was saying in Phenomenal Women. And yeah. that the two of them are the exact same poem, A Generation Apart. And that that was sort of the bridge, right? That was the connection. Yeah. And it was like, well, I can't, I don't want to read what they teaching me in school, but I do like this. And so I'm going to write poetry like the rappers I love. And that was my way into the game. That's dope. Yeah, man. That's dope. It's, I got, Jill going to make fun of me. My, she going to make fun of me. And she's like, because every time we, t I, she listens to the show and I'm, she's like, every time you talk about hip hop, you talk about literature, you talk about like how you was taught to rap. <laughs> and my father, like, I'm gonna say this shit because it's true. Um, but like I learned how to like to speak because my father taught me how to rap. And so that's how I learned how to speak. So like I'm definitely in the same boat with you. Like the thing I learned about language first was that it could be playful. So right. That, like the whole purpose of language was to play with it. Not the, well the purpose of language is to like convey meaning, but a part of language and then like a, sort of a prerequisite to even understanding a language was to play with it, play with the way it sounded, yeah. you know, different inflections, all those things. And so that's what became harder for me to accept that I was a writer because I, I, it, it was hard for me to do what I could do with my voice with language on a page. Like, how do you hit these different octaves? Yeah. 
where it's like I could say like you know bitch 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 like right, right, right. but it's like do I like italicize that like, <laughs> do I like cap is it all caps right, yeah, right, like, right how do you and how do I convey it to you in a way that I want you to read it the way I intended it to be read hmm. and that was like the first difficult that was that's the ongoing difficulty of writing it's and isn't it, there's also this weird like looking back right there's also sort of this idea that as a person of color uh, for me at least specifically. The freedom that I felt like I, I didn't feel like I had the liberty to use my own language, right? Mm-hmm. So like my natural tongue, right? Whatever my neighborhood sounded like, or my mother, or my father, or my family sounded like, I didn't feel. I, I was always told that was improper. I was always told that was wrong. And so writing and, and language in general was was a struggle um, until rap music because they were just like, yo, they saying it the way we say it, right? A prom- yo, think about Mary Poppins, right? You watch Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins is just making up shit. She just like you know super califragilistic, expialidocious, right? Like yeah. like she gets to say that. I don't get to say that until I hear Das Effects, and Das Effects says a super califragilistic tic tac toe, right? The same exact thing, right? But yeah. when they said it, I was like, oh word, I can say that if I want to. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can, I can, because they look like me. Yeah, I, you know what I mean? And it's it, it, hip hop. Look, I don't care forever and ever and ever as complicated and. As sometimes problematic as it is, I'm always, always, always going to stand up for hip hop and, and yeah. for because it saved my life and it right. saved an entire generation right. and it continues to do so whether we like to admit it or not. Yeah, and so we don't have what we have a book. We have four. Was it four books missing from here? We so have we set, uh, six books. I think. Six books missing. Six books. Dude got nine books. You yeah. got dropped three this year. Yeah, one year. You got the um the Miles Morales. Mm-hmm. Miles, Miles, Morales, Miles yeah. Morales Spider-Man story, yeah. which is a bestseller right now. Which is a bestseller. You got Patina that just dropped. It's a bestseller. bestseller right now, which yeah. is the second chapter, The Ghost. Yeah. Then we got Long Way Down, which has been long out. listed for a National Book Award. Yeah, it comes then you got the course. first book, When I Was the Greatest. When I was the greatest. That they got they had the gun on the front. Yeah. As they brave as you. They didn't want yes. they didn't, Yeah, they, they, when I was the greatest, they didn't, they didn't. We yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yo, I was like, and I hit this dude up, and I'm like, "Yo, did you bring your books?" And I'm like, "Who told me like you didn't bring them?" Yo, he but you like, should have known. Like, come on, everybody who know me, now like, yeah, you always float. You always yeah, float the I'm whole, chilling. Let yeah. the whole float. You don't you don't ever shoot somebody down and tell them what you, you let the possibility exist because it's like that would have been just so dramatic just to see like the whole front <laughs> row just books like this is just this one man's Yo, man. like arsenal. Let it's me how how do you you know what, the, what, what, with the prolific <laughs> ability to just write Yo, these many books, man. You know what, man? How do you do it? Uh some people call it, you know, a, a proliferation, right? But the truth is it's just obsession. Mm. Some some of this comes from obsession, right? Mm. And I mean that in in all the ways, the the healthy ways and the unhealthy ways. Yeah. Right? I think that um I have, I, I think there's fear, and I think that my fear of being of of um of losing, you know, we talk about look, we talk about white privilege a lot, right? In general, in the community, we it, like, especially right now, the privilege is like a conversation that's on the tip of a lot of people's tongues. But I think that it's I don't think we think about. Uh, the implicit ways that privilege affects people people of color and marginalized people in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when I first got in the game, Walter Dean Myers, rest in peace, God bless the dead, uh, he came to me, I was working in a clothing store in Soho, and he came to me and was like, yo, what's your schedule? Like, how much are you writing? And I said, I write two and a half pages in the morning and I write two and a half pages at night. And he said, all right, well, look, that's that's five pages a day. Now you write five pages a day, five days a week. That's twenty-five pages a week. That's a book every three months, and if that's four books a year, and if you write that many books, there'll be more books than any publisher can ever publish, and that way they won't be able to close the door on you. That's the mentality that I came into the game with, right? That's the mentality that I came into the game with, right? So, yeah. so for me, I I don't know any other way than that. Like that's what I know. Right. I always said if they give me. If they crack the door, right? There's a famous Walt Whitman quote, right? Un- unscrew the doors from their jams. And then he, he pauses for a moment. There's a beat. And then he says, uh, basically, you know, unscrew, like, unscrew the, uh, no, he says, unscrew the, unscrew the locks from the doors. And then he says, unscrew the, like, knock the doors off the jam. Okay. Right? And, and, yeah. and, and, and he has like a, a moment of, he has a moment of reflection where he sort of doubles back, where he says, unscrew the locks from their doors. And he says, actually basically knock the fucking door off yeah and so i always there you go and i always felt like if they open if they cracked the door a little bit i would basically bombard them so that they couldn't close it back down and that's what ended up happening right yeah man 
You know, fear is a real thing. Yeah. That's what privilege I mean. looks like, though. It's like your privilege forces me to do this. Mm-hmm. Right? Like this, this weird phantom privilege of whiteness, uh, and specifically in these kinds of industries, makes me feel like I have to do it this way because I don't have the luxury that I, f- I don't feel like I have the luxury of some of my colleagues who can put out a book every three years because I'm not exactly sure, at least I wasn't years ago. I w- I'm not exactly sure my upper, opera- I'm a, a little more secure these yeah, days, yeah, yeah. but I'm not exactly sure that my opportunity is still going to be there when it's time for book two. So I got to hit book one, two, and three before book one ever comes out, which is what happened. And that's such a, you know, that's so interesting because it's like, like what, what how do you, like? I'm 30, I'll be 34 in a couple so months. So you got me about seven years. And Which is crazy. Like how within seven <laughs> years, like, like our approaches to this is very different. Because, or at least, I think, no, it's not different. On the page is different. So, like, the way you're productive on the page in terms of, like, once I get the door open, I'm going like, to make sure I stay in. My thing is, my thing is sort of, like, in the same way, like, I, I want it so that you open the door before I even get there. Yeah, like that's been my approach. Is like, and it's it's still, and it's also propelled by the fear. My one of the biggest fears I have is you remember you know those high school movies, ten year anniversary, and the guy that was the coolest is like the lame, the like <laughs> dude peaked in high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that is one of the most scariest things to me. Like peaking glory days. Yo. Like being the guy who said like like you know like niggas in the hood be like. Yo, 86, I was on. Yeah. It's like, you don't want to be out Bundy. 2006. You don't want to be out Bundy, G. You know, you like, know, you know, out Bundy. Yeah. You know, out from well, married, was, from married with children. Yeah, he was the college. He was the high quarterback. The quarterback, yeah, poke yeah. high. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Four touchdowns in one game. You don't want to be that. Nah, <laughs> don't. And that scares me. And it, and, it, and that's what <laughs> like that's a, that's also how fear like fear propels me. But in a weird way, like the the, the fear comes from like just not like having that sort of such a high opinion of myself that it's like I can't fall below my own standard for what I know I can do hmm. and so if I know I could do it but it's not just what I know I can do it's, it's, the, it's what I know it's the way I can do it and right. I think that that's like you know what even like gave me and we were talking about this like the audacity to walk up to you or anybody to talk about what I have is like if I know that the worst thing that you could say is no then what's the worst thing that can happen? Right. Because if I don't ask you, then I gave myself the worst possible outcome, which yeah. is like not even knowing. But even that's still such a but that's such a gift, bro. Because there's so many people who just are too afraid to hear no. Rejection is like, yo, know, people are so are so penetrable, right? And that and, and rejection to a lot of people uh, feels like an anvil. When for you, it's like, mm. eh, right? You have this sort of like a chip, a big enough chip on your shoulder to say, dang, I'm gonna have to make you pay for that one. Right, you, right, like that. That's your that's, mentality, that's right? Mentality. Exactly, that's your mentality. Whereas most people are like crushed by no. You're like not enough vision, sir. You don't have enough vision, right? Yeah. <laughs> so let me. So on the subject of rejections, like because people who would like look at the at the way your books are like popping out, yeah, yeah, and they yeah, went yeah. to Coretta Scott Awards here, they get yeah, shortlisted yeah. there, and they would look like all oh, Jason gets are yeses. Tell, what? Tell them about that long road of nose. Yeah, that came before when I was the greatest. Was published in what two thousand six. When I, nah, when I was the greatest was published in 2014. Okay, damn. Okay. Right? But I've been in the industry since 2006. Okay, so I, okay. Right? So, okay. like, I, I got signed when I was 21. Uh, I just moved to New York, me and my buddy Jason. And you had a, yeah, had a, another book yeah. that I was with, yeah. With my buddy Jason, my, yeah. one of my, who, I talk, who I hung out with the other day, it was so good seeing him. Shout out to my man Jay Griffin. Uh, you know. You gotta put your people's on where you want to. When the camera's on, you know what I'm saying. Like Jason it. Douglas Griffin is his name, the talented <laughs> artist. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but but we were in college together. When we got out of school, we had made this book when we were in college, thirty thousand dollar book that we financed ourselves. Because back in the day, you could be eighteen years old and get a high a high yield credit card. You can get like a, a high limit credit card for nothing. God so damn. we so we got credit cards. I'm glad I didn't get that. Yeah, one yeah. Now it ruined it ruined my life right, for a long <laughs> time. You know what I'm saying? Like it was a terrible thing. Yeah. But the, but the process of making this book with with one of my best friends was amazing. We did this in our dorm room, uh, and then we moved to New York with this book that we made. Right. We yeah. get here back then. The internet was not nearly um, this sort of vast array of information that it is now. Back then, you had to be famous to have to be on the internet to have to be Googleable. You had to be somebody, right? Because there was no social media, mm-hmm. right? So we don't know how to get in the game nowadays. We got blogs, we got Twitter, we got all these. You could talk to an editor or an agent and be like, "What should I do to help me?" Yeah, Back yeah, then, yeah. we all we knew was rap music, and so for us, it was like, "Yo, this is gonna be our this is our demo." 
And we're going to run around to every magazine and every publishing company and drop off our demo to get them to publish it. That's what we thought. So what we did was we made a list of every pop and magazine at the time. So this is, and we thought like, like the Economist, Poets and Writers, Bomb Magazine, Poetry.com, uh, uh, Luomo, which is like an old school, like lifestyle yeah. men's magazine that was popping, right? Luomo, all these magazines, right? Interview Mag, all this crazy stuff, right? And we just ran around to all the buildings and was running up in buildings, running past security guards, dropping books <laughs> off. Once, like a real talk, hand to God, we were running in. Dropping off this book, being like, yo, 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 just check it out. You're going to love it. Just check it out. And finally, somebody was like, bro, that's just not how this works. You got to get an agent. And then we were like, well, how do you get an agent? And they were like, you got to write a proposal. We were like, like a query. And we were like, ain't nobody got time for that. So we started running around to the agencies, <laughs> doing the same, true story, doing the same now thing. Now we running up on y'all. We running up on y'all like, yo, this is the greatest is gift. The and, we, and we literally are dropping them off like, yo, this is what you want, right? This what you need. This this the heat. We're hustling. Right? We're hustling the agents. <laughs> Still, nobody's biting. And then finally, my homeboy from high school, shout out to my man Ernest, homeboy from high school, was like, yo, give it to me. He was on TV at the time, an actor. Gave it to his agent. His agent passed it through to her homegirl in the literary department of Paradigm. We get a phone call the next morning. Like, yo, I don't know who you are. I don't even know what this is. But the quality of it makes me want to talk to you because anybody willing to invest in themselves this much, I at least want to have a meeting with. Yeah. And that's what happened. So I go, we had this meeting. We chop it up. Six weeks later, we sit with Harper Collins. Six weeks after that, we started the process of writing a new book with Harper Collins. We signed this contract. The book comes out in two thousand and eight. It flops because the country also flips upside down. Oh, that was the, that the was recession, the right? Yes. Every single publicity department gets chopped immediately. They're the first to go. Why? That, why? 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 Why that department? Because they're, they're the because technically, uh, and shout out to the publicity teams out there. But technically, they're they're I guess if we're looking at the hierarchy of publishing, you can't cut. You can't cut the C-suite because they're the money men. You can't cut the sales department because they're going to figure out where to place it. You can't cut the editors for obvious reasons. And you can't cut manufacturing because they have to get the book made. Yeah. The only expendable department. That's fucked up. Yo, it's crazy, right? So everybody's cutting publicity departments. We had a publicity intern. She was like, I'm out. I'm going back to college. <laughs> right? Which is what everybody was doing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so the book comes out. It tanks. It flops. I mean, everything else terrible starts happening. And then I, we, Jason and I start writing tons of books together, each one being turned down by the agent. The agent wouldn't even sell it. She wouldn't even try to pitch it. Right? I wrote like 40 children's books, bro. Like, yo, before anybody. It's crazy. And then, and then what ends up happening is I just quit. I quit. I'm like, yo, I'm good. So I take a job at the clothing store where I had decided to work for, till I was 50. I was good with working in the clothing store. To 50. Straight. Because I knew because wait, it, how old are you when you decided this? Twenty six. This nigga. Because because in New York, because in New York, you can make so much bread mm-hmm. working in high end retail. Mm-hmm. I knew people who were like fifty years old making two hundred thousand dollars a year working at Prada or working at Chloe. So I was like, this is sweet. Yeah, I got insurance. I got free metro. I'm chilling. They pay me metro cars where I worked. God damn it. Yeah. So so I'm good. And then finally, Chris Myers, Walter D Myers' son, was like, dog, you got to at least try one more time. And then I stood at the cash register with a notebook, and I wrote when I was the greatest. Mm. And that's what happened. And then everything changed. I got to fire my agent, call my old editor at Harper. What who, does firing an agent look like? It, it literally looks like this ain't working out. Like firing anybody, this ain't working oh, out. It's like on some ditty shit where you like nah, the phone nah, where nah. you can't hear nothing back. Nah, it's love. It's like, oh, you know you're not representing me. You know you don't believe in the work that I'm making. Yeah. It's not for you. You rep- You want to rep, you know, you want something science, science fiction or you want fantasy or whatever you want, but that's not what I make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got a boogie, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I ended up bouncing and called my old editor at Harper, Joanna Kotler, who basically was a mentor and taught me how to write narrative, which I did not know because I was a poet. Yeah. And she taught me how to write story art, taught me all of that when I was working with her at Harper to try to get this book out. Yeah. And that's how shit changed. And then I got a new deal and, you know. So let's, let's, let's go into like the craft. Yeah. And let's, let's do some craft talk. Yeah. I'm going to start section off craft talk. That's what's up. <laughs> but um, when you, when you were writing poetry, give me some language of what you understood of the craft of poetry. Like, how would you describe poetry? Mm. Uh, in my tradition. Right, because I think first of all, poetry is there are lots of traditions, and unfortunately, yeah. the black tradition, uh, specifically the tradition that is the trajectory of the black arts movement, which is the trajectory of the Harlem Renaissance, right? Yeah. Um, and to me, which dates back to Phyllis Wheatley, that that sort of trajectory and that tradition, I don't think is talked about enough. So, in my tradition, in right. that tradition, I believe there has to be stakes, there has to be intention, um, there has to be, uh, um, you have to be decisive. In terms okay. of the words you use, yeah. uh, and 
um, you have to know how to enter. You have to know how to exit. Right? They are very specific for me in my viewpoint. Right? Now I don't have the education to back this up, but this is the way that I've always sort of seen it. Like there has to be, uh, they, 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 there's not enough room. They can't be they, for us. There isn't room for ambiguity. There isn't room for that which is vague. It doesn't mean that it's not sophisticated and multi-layered. But but I need to make sure that the people that I'm writing this for know that I'm writing it for them. Okay. That they, that, that, right? Like, I can't be Robert Frost looking out of my window in Vermont. So I can't write transcendentalism. I can't write, mm -hmm. I mean, I can, but but for me, art, if I were alive when they were having a discussion of art for art's sake, I probably would have been one of the people who have been like, nah. Yeah. Like, I don't know if we're in a space where we can afford to do that. I'd like to believe that, like, I want to do that at some, some point and sometimes, and at some point I will, but I, I'm not so sure that, and our tradition just isn't that, right? right? At least not at the moment. And at some point, it will evolve into that maybe, but nah. Yeah. I'm not going to do, I can't be John Ashbery putting together sort of like, like John, I saw John Ashbery say one time, like in person, he's like, yeah, you know, to me, the brain is a conveyor belt of words. I plop out a word here. I plop out another word there. I put them side by side and see what happens. And it's like, yeah, nah, not for me. Mm -hmm. For me, yeah, I have, I mean, you know what like I mean? The luxury, I mean, that, like the whole idea of like, you know, and the thing I constantly talk to people about on this show, and just period, is this whole idea of like the fact that the actual time that you need to dedicate to read someone's work is time. And if you're writing for people who you know do not have the time to sit there, there you go. trying to figure things out, it's like you should come figure it out. Like, help me figure this out as opposed to like, no, you got to figure this out as well. It's like, well, like, you know, there's no even, there's no guarantee even when I read this, this is going to help change anything for me and so like when you talk about those stakes like that's something i think that that right black writers especially come to with and everything they write the stakes i right. saw when, when claire masu was on here she said something that i thought was so interesting but that i disagree with right and she's like but but, but, but it's also coming from her tradition right yeah. so she's like she's like you know i don't think that books necessarily have to have a point right and, and my thing is i don't know if i'd say they have to have a point but i know that um and I don't think that this has to be, there, has, there doesn't have to be didacticism. There doesn't have yeah. to be sort of anything heavy handed. It doesn't have to be a browbeat. Yeah. But I think that even a book that is a slice of life has a point because my life, my, who I am as a person, my being, my existence in and of itself is political. My, my, my me just having, me yeah. breathing and being alive mm -hmm. uh, is poignant mm -hmm. just because. Yeah. So to show black kids sitting on a stoop chilling is political. Because so many black kids are never seen as children. Right. And that doesn't have to be me proving a point. It's just me saying that this thing in and of itself, in essence, is a point. Yeah. And that's tradition. That's our, I mean, that's what these are, right? Yeah. Like, tradition. So, go a bit now to the transition, right? And from poetry. Yeah. Into narrative. Yeah. How, like, what was that transition? And what did you understand of narrative that to you was different than writing poetry? Uh, more words. <laughs> a lot, a lot of, a lot of my words. You know, you know what it was. Man? At first, I, I was always sort of um, afraid of prose. I always said I would never write prose. I would never write a novel. Why not? Too many words. I was a kid who didn't grow up reading. I didn't. So you felt I didn't, like you didn't I didn't, have a language. I, I felt like I didn't have enough of it. Okay. I didn't have. Um, uh, I didn't have like a well of it, right? Which I thought you needed to write three hundred pages. I mean, I didn't mm -hmm. read. I didn't read a novel, a full novel, until I was almost eighteen years old. Um, okay. um, that sounds like my life. That sounds like most of our, but that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. And so, and so for me, it just seemed far fetched to be able to write a whole thing, or to yeah. a, whole, a whole book. What I did understand though is um, what poetry gave me. That I think uh, I teach grad school, and when I, some of my students, I think the one thing that they don't get is that poetry gave me freedom. Uh, and that, yes, I, I did grow up learning. I mean, I came up in, 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 in the academy sort of studying poetry and learning form and all that in the third. Mm -hmm. But it, within that form, I learned so much freedom. I, like, there's a reason we call it poetic license. There's a reason, mm -hmm. right? Like, it, yeah. like it, it's the poetry of it all that I think teaches us that freedom. Uh, I have no problem writing one word sentences in my novels. I have no problem writing fragments and, and breaking the line, even in prose, because I was, because that's all I know. Like that freedom that I got from poetry, it taught me not just the science of, of language, um, but it taught me into how to trust my intuition, how to trust my gut and what feels good, mm -hmm. right? There has to be something that is visceral for me when it comes to language. And I think so much of what I read is so cerebral um, that, it, that it almost feels soulless. Uh, and, and and poetry gave me poetry allows me to add elements of like that like that spirit that zhuzh into 
prose. And it taught me how to start and stop. So I know how to begin a chapter and I know how to end it. Mm-hmm. Every chapter could stand alone. And that makes sense because you, when you read, you do a lot of your readings. People are going to hear it later when you read for the show. But you read, you do read with that performative aspect that a lot of poets sort of learn yeah. to adopt. Um, so writing for children. Yeah. You writing do for it. children. You do it well. <laughs> I was, I was, when I first, I, I first, like, I bought, um, I ne- I did not make a habit of reading YA because of the thing. I'm like, man, this shit gonna be yeah, yeah, yeah. simple or whatever. Like, yeah. I'm not reading it. So I wrote, I bought him, like, this is my guy. He ain't kicked me out of peaches. <laughs> I bought a book. And I read it, and, you know, Boy in a Black Suit, and I yeah. was like, yo, this is heavy. Mm-hmm. And I think that the thing that they people do not give YA credit for. Yeah. Unless I'm sorry, unless you're studying like the purchasing, uh, you know, trends of it that more adults are buying YA. Yeah. Than even kids. Yeah. Um, what was it that made you want to get into writing YA? Mm. You know what, man. First of all, it, it matters to me that you um, have been supportive of this work, right? And I and I just want to make sure that we take a moment to say that. That I take a moment to say that it matters to me that you have me on the show. It matters to me that you include me in all the things. It, it matters to me because, because mm, I won't say most, but there are many, 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 many people who felt like you did. Yeah. Right. There are many people who see writing for children as something that is less than, as if they didn't grow up reading children's books. Yeah. Which yeah, is so yeah. strange, right? Yeah, They're yeah, part yeah. of our development. Um, Nonetheless, uh, for me, man, I never chose to be a children's book writer. It, it happened to me, and I don't see that as a slight. I see it almost as like my fortune, like fortune yeah. shined down upon me, right? Yeah. I, 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 when when Jason and I came to New York, the book that we made because it was art and poetry, they were like, "Look, there's no way that we can market this because it's an art book." And so, in order for us to even have an opportunity to turn a buck, we got to market it toward kids. So, yeah. we'll, so we'll shrink the trim size. We'll rewrite everything. We'll make it more marketable. We'll make it more narrative. We're, like this, these are, this is all publishing stuff. And then they categorized it as young adult at the time. Oh. Yeah, at the time wow. we didn't even know that young adult was a thing. Mm. We thought that what we had written, we had written for adults, right? And because our, our original book was about basically grown up, like our first heartbreaks. Looking back on it, of course, it's for young people. But we we happen to be nineteen, right? Right, and so they categorized it as young adult before the YA boom, which has happened as is happening now, right? And, and it has happened, right? But before that, um, there was no. It was different. It just wasn't. It just wasn't like that. And so we didn't know what it was. We were like, all right, cool, whatever. Just put my book in the store. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it came when it, when it came time for me to get back in the game, I only my Rolodex in publishing is in one category. I didn't know nobody on the adult side. I didn't know no right. I came through the my first book was a YA book, yeah. and so when and so when I finally was like, I'm gonna get back in the game. The people that I could call my plugs, yeah. my editor, my old agent, like these people that I needed to like figure out how to navigate me back into the literary industry, worked in children's literature. Yeah, and so they were like, Well, what you got? And the thing that I wrote when I was the greatest happened to be something, but I didn't think about it that way. Yeah. Now I'm good with it. Well, that makes sense because yeah. I think that that's why like so many kids, and if you you know following Jason. On the gram, like these kids be treating you like like you little Uzi. They be yeah. like, ah! <laughs> like, what the yeah. hell? It's amazing. All this man. for a book. It's amazing. It's amazing. But I think when you know, listening to the way you're describing it, it seems what what's happening is that like your YA treats kids like adults. That's it. Like it it, it 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 even like reading um Ghost where he breaks down when he steals the sneakers. And he like shows you the inner workings of his mind, of his like mind. why he stole it, like, exactly. And it's like, nah, that's like that's real. That's shit. real. Like, that's yeah. how it, that's how kids think. They don't want to add more pressure to their parents' they lives, know. and in an attempt to like re- remove it, they end up adding more. They add right? and adding and exactly. So, but go into like because we have the three books here, and you got yeah. two other books. You brought what you brought here. Oh, you don't don't just touch them like that. These are these are special. <laughs> okay. You know okay, don't just my put bad. your hands on my, them like my that. Bad. So, you know what I'm saying? So you, you, all right, we're going to start with this one. All right. start with this one. So this is Simple Uncle Sam. Simple Uncle Sam. I don't know if y'all... I'm hoping y'all know something about Langston Hughes' Simple. So so this is this is uh, one of my favorites. Uh, and it's just a collection of Langston Hughes' Simple stories mm-hmm. about the character Simple, who... Um, I don't know if y'all... So if y'all don't know, let me just get some background. So Langston Hughes wrote all these stories about this character named Simple. And pretty much every story takes place at the bar. Okay. All right. And I'm really, I've been studying a lot of this stuff because I think that what Langston Hughes understood was that 
the traditional, the, the short story as we know it today, yeah. it's like 10 pages. Langston Hughes. Really? Yeah, as we know it today. Oh, okay. It, right? Okay, it's okay, like okay. 10, 10, 15 pages, right? As a short read story. I short stories that was like, it's, when does this happen? Exactly. Like, 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 and, and on, right? Exactly. Yeah. 20 pages, right? Yeah. Langston Hughes was writing three, four page short stories. Wow. And they're genius. And I'm trying to figure out how to bring that back, how to, how to figure out a way to, like, I'm submitting it, I'm putting some stuff in some stuff. I can't really talk too much about it. But I'm, I want to write shorter short stories if they work. I think that you should only. I think that literature gets funny when people feel like there has to be page limits to that, which to make a story good, instead of writing a story to the length of which it's necessary. That's it. When the story is over, yeah, right. The story yeah. is over, right. Yeah, and if that, that means, sense. you see what I mean. And yeah. so he's doing three, four pages of pop about the same character sitting at a bar talking to the narrator, yeah. and he mentions like you know his wife Joyce, his sister, right, and and every story, yeah. and he's just going in about it's bar talk, but it's brilliant. Like yo. They say we ain't gonna get no president to 2011, right? That's what, like, this whole, like, yeah. stuff that black people talk about, especially in this time, um, and it's brilliant. Now, and it, and it's teaching me. I'm a big fan of Langston. I think he's, I actually think that as lauded as he is, he's actually still very much so underrated. They still don't get him. He's so right. underrated. He needs the Brooklyn Botanical He He, he, he needs, yeah, like, now this, there are only a few of these. Uh-oh. That exists. He brought the he brought the black copy. There are only a few, bro. Like, and you always you posted like you saw Lewis Carroll's like first edition of Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. He's sliding out like All right. what, is, what is this? Everybody knows the poems in it, but very few people have seen the actual book. So this is the actual book. Oh. Yeah. Montage of a Dream Deferred. The actual book. Um Is this like a first edition? Uh I don't even know. I don't think so. I don't think it's the first edition, but I know it's only one of the few editions left. Like it's only a few copies in in, in because you know this it flopped in real life when it when he came out. <laughs> yeah, like in real so, life. yeah, yeah. Real, when yeah. when it when it came out, he thought it was the best thing he'd ever written, and it, and it flopped. Um, and yeah. yo, for those of you who haven't read it, I know you all know Mother to Son, right? Well, boy, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no Christmas day, right? Everybody knows sort of that that yeah. poem. Um, and everybody knows, you know, like dream deferred, right? What happens to a dream deferred, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. The rest of this book, Son Langston was on some like, bro, like if you just look through the book, like, yeah. and, and you can hold it, I'm, you know. Yeah, I'm not going. Nah, it's all good. Man. It's, it's a book. It's cool. Yeah. But, uh, you know, these are like some of my prized possessions. I mean, I, I collect, I'm a collector. Right now I'm collecting a bunch of Langston Hughes letters. I'm, I'm buying them. Um, you know, spending all my money trying to just collect. Spends his book money on spend, books. I spend my book money on books and on, and on just making sure on, an, on ephemera that I love and care for. Uh, I think that Langston had a lot to teach us. I think that we only get a portion of it. Um, I think his poetry was genius, but I think it was more genius than many of us know. Yeah. I think his prose was brilliant and poetic, and I think even that was more brilliant than it, many of us know. I think yeah. we, I think we, we, we speak about him on the surface and and we keep him in the periphery. Uh, when in actuality, I think that we should probably be studying him in a different. We should study him the way that we study Shakespeare. To mm. me, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, that's and this is dedicated to Ralph Ellison. Yes, his wife. bro. Yes. Is it is the poem is one of my favorite poems. Is it is it first? Let's see if it's a first right quick. I never actually checked it. This might be a first edition. You if it's a first, we're gonna put it back in the box. You, you might oh you gotta put that oh! back in the box. You gotta put that back in the box. That's like a that's like a strain might that, yeah. that might break strain. Might yeah, that's hilarious. That yeah, man. Um so read something for the people from one of these books. You got three books. You can read so you can read a little bit from all three, you can read something, you can read something. Do it give us yeah, we give read us something from Ghost Man. This dude, man. Nine like nine books. Yeah. Wrote forty. I'm yeah. trying to figure out the first one. Yeah, whatever. You you are. Right. You got you got this, you know what I'm saying? We got this is a literature. Yo, I've said this to so many people. Um This show, if you watch enough episodes, this is like getting an MFA. Because you got some yeah, of you, the best writers coming up here talking some heavy shit about nah. When, like, Vic, when Victor Laval was up here, I was like, <laughs> I was just, I was looking at the screen. I was watching it on YouTube, and I was looking at the screen, and I was just like, yo, I feel like I'm getting a master class. <laughs> it is. I mean, like, and I, I didn't even, I forgot who said it to me, but somebody was like, yo, this is like an MFA. Like, I ain't got to, because of this class, because of this show, I ain't got to even go to school now. Like, getting, it's amazing, dude. Getting lessons from, you know, fucking Tyemba Jess folding poems. Yo, up. bro. Yeah, that, that dude. That dude. Yeah. <laughs> 
it's true. I just gotta say, man, like it's it's an amazing time to be uh to be in this to be in this game. It's an amazing time to be a writer. And I just really to all the writers that are watching, man, to all the people that's watching, but specifically to my colleagues, um, I just got a lot of respect and a lot of love for you. Um Stop fronting on these children's literature books, though, because nah. just trust that we can have the same conversations. Please believe yeah. that that we can we can bang with most of y'all, and that, yeah, that's weird. They treat people it's who real write, funny. Who like, write for kids like kids. It's like, crazy. You don't know. I'm like, we got the same education. We got like this is about categorization. And furthermore, it should never be a problem to look out for these children. Right. And so if you got issues with us, if you if you think that what we do uh, is is rudimentary and elementary and less than, what you're really saying that which is that you think that the opinions of children. Are rudimentary and elementary and less than, and I would challenge you to check yourself. Furthermore, before I begin this, I also oh, like shit. to say that <laughs> what we do, uh, you know, like my buddy Chris used to always say, is like, look, you got to paint the Mona Lisa with a full palette if you write for adults, right? And that's a challenge. I got to paint the same Mona Lisa, got to look just like Mona Lisa, same color scheme and all, with half the palette. Please don't come for me. Please, please no. Please no, son. Do that, we, that don't do it. We can have it. Like anybody who know me. Who know me in that world knows that like we can have these conversations, the same conversations you have with your homies, you can have with me, despite the fact that I choose, yeah. choose to uh-huh. to to uh to write for kids. And lastly, next, next time you see us, next time you see us and you think about saying something disrespectful, and uh-huh. please believe there's fluff on my side. There's a lot of fluff in our in, in our category. It's there's a, a, lot a lot of fluff, fluff on in your category too. Yeah, nah, it's a lot of fluff in the lyrics. Yeah, it's a lot of fluff. But next time you think about saying something disrespectful. Or, or derogatory or belittling, please understand that all the fans you get and all the support you get and all the people who buy your books, uh huh, we made them. Ooh. They don't you don't you don't get to have fans unless we do our work to grow your readership. If they can't read and write, mm-hmm. you don't have no book sales. Ooh. Just so we clear. That's all. All love though, Damn. but enough is enough with the weird hierarchy. And shout out to Lisa Lucas. Who I've talked about this and 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 you know yeah. she we're trying to figure out ways. I got to, to sort of I had to give you a nickname. <laughs> Your name is Jason. Talk to me nicely, Reynolds. <laughs> Yo, like talk, it is what it put is. Some like, put, put, some put some respect on it. Put some respect. Put some respect. So like, read something from Ghost because you out here just body and just talking. This oh, is man. damn. Yeah. Talk to me nicely. Don't talk, talk to me at all. Do it. Um. All right. Let's see. So we're gonna talk about. When Ghost, so Ghost is Ghost is basically explaining his love of uh, sunflower seeds. This is the beginning of Ghost. It's a young man named Castle who uh, is basically talking about how much he loves sunflower seeds and how he goes to the store in his neighborhood and gets sunflower seeds every single day and where that comes from. About the sunflower seeds, I used to just put a whole bunch of them in my mouth at the same time and suck all the salt off and then spit them all out machine gun style. I could have probably set a record in that too, but now I've matured. Now I take my time moving them around, positioning them for the perfect bite to pop open the shell, then carefully separating the seed from it with my tongue. Then, and this is the hard part, keeping that little seed safe in the space between my teeth and tongue, I spit the shells out. And finally, after all that, I chew the seed up. I'm like a master at it, even though honestly, sunflower seeds don't really taste like nothing. I'm not even sure they really worth all the hassle, but I like the process anyway. My dad used to eat sunflower seeds too. That's where I get it from. But he used to chew the whole thing up, the shells, the seeds, everything, just devour them like some kind of beast. When I was really young, I used to ask him if a sunflower was going to grow inside of him since he ate the seeds so much. He was always watching some kind of game like football or basketball, and he turned to me just for a second, just long enough to not miss a play and say, sunflowers be all up in me, kid. Then he'd shake up the seeds in his palm like dice before throwing another bunch in his grill to chomp down on. But let me tell you something. My dad was lying. Wasn't no sunflowers growing in him. Couldn't have been. I don't know a whole lot about sunflowers, but I know they pretty. And I know girls like them. And I know the word sunflower is made up of two good words. And that man ain't got two good words in him or anything that any girl would like. Because girls don't like men who try to shoot them and their son. And that's the kind of man he was. There we go. We God. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> 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 about to guzzle this dude. <laughs> oh, man. So, um, what the fuck? What is it like when you read for these kids, man? I don't read for kids. Really? No. You don't read when you go to those schools? Nope. Why not? So, is it in your router? <laughs> I will not read yeah, for these Ain't children. no reading for these don't little ones. Don't ask me. For nah, the nah, children. You know what, I man? I won't do it. The reason I don't read for for the kids is because I'm going to schools. 
And the one thing that every kid in the crowd, the one thing they don't want is for you to come to the school and read and talk to them about reading when that's all they do all day. Mm. So, so my theory is, um, is basically, look, at the end of the day, people invest in people, bro. Uh, we want kids to read and write. Then uh, this generation needs to know that you are who you say you are. And so I show up to the schools. Yeah. I look like I look. I show up just like this in my same clothes, short sleeve T-shirts and sneakers and jeans. Uh, that's the Jason Rose. That's special. that's my, you know, I keep it simple. You know, I keep yeah. it light. I show up. And the first thing I ask all the kids in the crowd at every single school, whether it's a rich school or a Title I or a juvenile detention center or an alternative school, the first thing I always say is how many of y'all like ramen noodles? And they all put their hands up. And then I... And then I tell a story about, about how me and my brother used to make ramen noodles. And I say, how many of y'all like Kool-Aid? And they all put their hands up. And then I tell a story about how we used to make the Kool-Aid as kids and how we would give the Kool-Aid, the extra Kool-Aid to our homegirls to dye their hair with. Right? Mm-hmm. Then I t- talk about the ice cream truck. I talk about going to my man house and eating the welfare peanut butter, ripping up the bread, trying to, that trying to get that, that hard peanut butter. butter right? Yeah. Like we, we, we talk Only in retrospect, if you put some oil in that motherfucker. <laughs> Or if you or buy. just or just toast the bread, then they won't rip the bread up. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But like, but like, you know, we talk about all of this, and then I say, I say, so imagine what it was like knowing that that's the way I grew up, and like all the things that you were all laughing about and having a good time about. Imagine what it was like to go to a school and be asked to read a book about a man chasing a whale, right? They want you to read Moby Dick, but I've never seen a whale, never seen a boat when I was a kid. They want me to read To Kill a Mockingbird, but we ain't have no Atticus Finches in my neighborhood. Mm. Right, and so for me, uh, I did. I, this is literally how I start every every joint, and it's all laughing and joking. And then by the end of it, and I just tell my story. I just talk about what it was like to, to discover Queen Latifah's po- uh, uh, raps and like yeah. writing poetry. What it was like to sort of deal with all the family issues as my family changed and shifted, as my neighborhood changed and shifted, as the, the eras sort of moved on from the crack epidemic to this, to that, to the, and the third. To watch my brother deal with all the things my brother had to deal with, my father sort of leaving and dealing with all of that stuff. All the things that we go through, yeah. and how the thing that kept me was poetry and the idea that I could grow up to become Queen Latifah, right? Like that was my thing. Mm -hmm. And then I talk about college and how I struggled in college, but that this chip on my shoulder wouldn't leave me alone and how I failed English 101 twice, right? Failed it, failed it twice because I hadn't read any books. I didn't, like I told you, I didn't, nobody told me that I could use my voice in an essay writing, right? As I failed English 101 twice. Then I took Shakespeare and told my Shakespeare teacher that Shakespeare is trash, even though Shakespeare is not trash. But when I was a kid, (laughs) I was like, Shakespeare is trash and and gave my teacher my Queen Latifah poems and said, read these poems and you're going to understand why I know Shakespeare is trash. And then of course he told me the poems are bad, right? And how I felt like, dang, he don't know no better. I was like you, right? It's like, he, he don't know. (laughs) <laughs> right then talking about my, my, my graduation and my commencement speech and how to do it and commencement told me that I was going to either be a, a teacher or a lawyer but not a writer because English degrees couldn't be writers and so I, I yo this is what I'm saying so I tell this whole then I talk about New York City I talk about succeeding then failing about blowing my money on sneakers and lobster and my mama's bills and right, all of this happens right Every all of that's in the, in the talking at the very very yeah. end and, after yeah. I, and this is an hour at the very very end I say now that's my story and they brought me here to tell y'all to read and write. So read and write. But but more important, <laughs> literally, this, this is literally what I say. And, and so so read and write. But more important, more importantly, right? Though I know, though I want you to love my story, it's more important that you all understand now that it, that that you have to love your own, mm. right? And that reading and writing is is this strange relationship between us and narrative. But like, what does it matter if we have no relationship with our own narratives? If we can't own our own stories? The minute that I knew that I could put my tongue on the page, a tongue that everybody told me was, you come from the wrong hood, you got the wrong friends, your family don't speak the right kind of English, all this kind of, yeah. the, the minute I was cool with all of that and was like, yo son, this is what's going to make me special, game changer. And that is what happens at these school visits. And after that, everybody like, yo, we want to read his books. Not because he said read books, but because we fuck with him. Tupac could have made candles, bro. And all of us would have bought Tupac candles. Bug life candles, nigga. And all of us would have been like, yo, I don't, we don't really burn candles in the crib, but I'm Pac making we'll, candles. We'll Think right. about the S. Dot Carters. I remember when the S. Dot Carters came out, niggas was really trying to convince me that them shit was hot. My mother was like, yo, you got to get the, the S. Dots. You got to get the S. Dots. You got to get the G units. You got to get the G unit sneakers. That's exact. Right. And they sold because we believed in them. Fat farms, fat farms sold because we believed in Russ. Yeah, that's that, true. It, that's the way it works. A lot of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason that all of us coming up here rocking with you. Yeah. The reason that we're all rocking with you and that we've been rocking with you is because of you. Yeah. It's not about product. It's not about, it's, it's about you. Yeah, people yeah. invest in people. The right. same works for these kids.
I don't even know where to go from there. Like, this, this nigga just end up show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, so this is this is yours. Oh. Yeah, we got. I'm waiting for this though. Brought me some, the douce. My man brought a bottle of douce up here yeah. to the team. He yeah, brought yeah, bottles yeah. of douce. You got because because the children's authors got class. You feel me? <laughs> <laughs> We got we got class I'm out like, here. Where your bottle at, man? Go back. Yeah, home. take Go. it back. Get out of here. So we don't like the kind. Yeah, so like oh. you know, for being lit. You, I'm lit. I'm gonna put this on my back. Yeah, I'm lit. Good luck, homie. You definitely, you definitely. Yeah, I appreciate it. So man. you got some events coming up. You got some dope events coming up. One special event. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> it. October third. I, I don't even. October Comic-Con. fifth. October fifth. My bad. October I need. I don't even know. Oh, his, his book dropped the third. The event is on on the fifth. So, yo, it's kind of wild because I never really said it out loud yet on like a, in like a public sort of space. Man, but I'm doing this thing at Comic-Con, New York Comic-Con, October 5th. I'm in conversation with ta Coates. We doing a, uh, we talking about his Black Panther and my Spider-Man and, and just the ideas around black superheroes and what that means. Um, not just for children, but for popular culture, right? What does that mean to see us in that way? And I'm excited, dude. I'm a little, I'm not going to front because I, I try not to be a liar, but I'm, I'm a little intimidated. <laughs> I'm a little intimidated. I just be honest, all right? I'm, I'm a little. I'm not. Look, I, I'm good. I can hold my own, especially since we're talking about like this and not like. Uh, I'm, if he like, yo, what you think about reparations? I'm gonna be like, what you think? What you, <laughs> <laughs> like, what you think? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, but I'm excited, man. I'm excited to just to just sit and chop it up with him. Um, I hope I hope he got his cool off and, and we just ready to you know just have a have. A, I hope he I hope we can just have a good time. You know what I mean? Take yeah. it cool off. Time, time, you listen and take it cool off, bro. You know what I'm saying? Let, let's just have a good time yeah. and, and chop it up. All right. So, um. You coming? Hell yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> like, if I got to sneak in, I'm going to be there. Like, I'm, I'm going to be right front row, like sitting there with the camera, like bootlegging the event on, on Instagram Live. That's yeah, a big one. Um, yo, so literary swag before you get out of here. I remember when we first did it, it was. And I, I think yours is probably the only one I remember because I've done like so many of them. But I know. Remember it was James, yeah. it was Tony, yeah. and I think it was uh, it was Langston in yeah. the first one. Yeah. Uh, who like, did it update? Did the swag update? I think it's different. Yeah, it's different. Where you I mean, right? I still love all those people, but you know, different parts of your life. Yeah. Right, so right now, now, if I had to say literary, all right. So literary, I'm going Jasmine. Jasmine, okay. For sure. <laughs> Shout out to Jasmine Ward. Honestly, Jasmine, if you're watching this, I just think you're a hero. Not for me. I mean, for me too, but for mm-hmm. for a lot of us, we be fronting, but like we we be checking you. Like, thank you for the work you're doing. So shout out to Jasmine. Um, I gotta go with my man Langston. Uh, and honestly, man, I really just think we should be shining more light on this cat John A. Williams, who we lost okay. a couple years ago. Okay. Uh, who was a part of the, came up in the seventies. This dude was a beast. So shout out to John A. Williams. Just put me on. Sons Thank of you. Darkness, Sons of Light is a brilliant, 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 brilliant book that okay. that is so slept on. Right. Um, uh, and in the swag right now, uh, I guess we gotta go with the goose because I got so many of my sneakers. Is always a goose, and the reason why is because they got terry cloth on the inside, and I don't like to wear socks, so it's good for it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> your, your shoes never stink. That's the reason. That's the reason I got so many pairs. Seriously. So rock out. So shout out to Golden Goose. Um, Yo, real talk, you know who never loses? Issey Miyake on the low. So Issey Miyake, shout out to Issey Miyake. And um, shout out to uh, the Gucci shoe people. And not the sneakers, the rest of the shoes, y'all killing. Gucci a little overdone right now. I'm just going to put it out there. I know a lot of my homies. I get, I get it. Yeah. But like... Things will kill anything. We we are killing it right now. Gucci is a little overdone for me, for me. But the Gucci shoe department on the hard bottom side, like the actual <laughs> shoes, not the sneakers, the hard bottom the shoes, Gucci shoe the Gucci shoe on the hard right bottom below side. The ankle, y'all yeah, y'all like doing it. y'all like above uh, the ankle, soft bottom. Listen, anything that's this. anything that's white or any of that, nah. But the the standard like dress shoe collection, y'all are killing. Mm. So shout out to them folks. Right on, right on. So you can buy um, one of uh, Jason's 300 books, wherever books are sold. He probably, they're going to have a whole section, like yeah. a Jason Reynolds section at a bookstore. I hope so. Yeah, so we got um, the, the books that came out this year alone. Uh, we got Patina. Patina that dropped last month. Yeah. Early this month. Last month. In the last month. In the last month. Miles we got Morales. Miles Morales. The beginning of last month. The beginning of last month. So the Spider-Man, the Patina, which is the second book to this, yeah. which is from a female's 
protagonist perspective. Yeah, yeah. Shout I got out to it. The black girls. I got it. I got it. I'm excited to read. Shout out to the black girls. How you inhabit that? Yeah. Um, and then long and way then, down. And then long way down, which drops August. I mean October 24th. All right. And oh, one more thing. Yes. Support your local bookstores. So I'm making these first. All, all I'm making these first booksellers. Oh yeah. Uh, ambassador for the year okay so of all independent bookstores so, in america so it's not wherever books are sold it's only where independent bookstores Indi- are yeah yeah, yeah. make we, sure we're not rocking it. with the big we're not rocking with the machines with the big wig. shout out to your mom and pop independent booksellers please support your local bookstores know where they are please 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 support your local booksellers most of all stuff. right let Indies me ask first. you before you get out of here what was it like re- writing as a female protagonist what was what was something you learned about yourself writing as a, in writing a book from the you know what? Uh, you know what? Uh, this is a question I get a lot, and and I. The one thing that I think I wanted to make clear, and the one thing that was most interesting, and the one thing I always tell people is that writing a writing a uh, a young lady, um. Is first writing a person, writing a human being, mm. and I think the reason that we see so many differences and this idea that like yo was it mad different and it's like nah it wasn't mad different. Mm-hmm. I, I wrote it. I wrote a person. Uh, who happen to be younger. Now, are the details different? Yes, there are details that are different, but most of those details have, have everything to do with the fact that we live in a patriarchal society. And so what I wanted to show, instead of writing a, a, a woman who was boy-obsessed, I decided to leave all that out. Instead of writing a girl who was sort of like super catty, I decided to leave a lot of that out. I mean, she she has her moments, but like all that's out. Instead, what I wanted to talk about was what does it mean to be, all the girls I grew up with couldn't be girls. They had to be grown women. Mm. Right, immediately, like you turn yeah. 10 to 11, it's like you got to navigate the streets, you got to do this, that, and the third, you got to take care of your little brothers and sisters, you got to yeah. make dinner, you got to make lunch, you got to clean the house. It's like I wanted to make sure that we talked about the fact that there are young women in this country that many, many, many of all races and cultures who are past the baton too young, right? All right, and then on that note, yeah, shout out to y'all, man, appreciate you, bro. And thank you, God, shit, this shit, this episode, <laughs> god damn, yeah. So follow us <laughs> at the platform on all the platforms. Follow your boy. Drink your Duce. At the Mar Duce. Mm. You drink Duce too. Mar Duce specifically. Shout yeah, out to Jay Z by the way. Yeah, shout shout out to him. Shout out to this. Yo, it's too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! This has been another episode of Lit. We out. Yo, follow Pink Pig. <laughs>